Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We are better together. And I'm with my dear brother here, Dr. Charles Kinman. And thank you so much for joining us here today, You're welcome. my welcome. brother. Uh, Dr. Charles is a, a fairly new friend for me. We met and just connected uh, instantly uh, to let you know who he is. He spent nine years uh, in the Air Force. Thank you for your uh, amazing service. Then he served 10 years in pastoral roles, then 24 years as the director of counseling and a state licensed marriage and family therapist at Bethany Christian Assembly in Everett, Washington, uh, providing over 35,000 hours of counseling to individuals and families. Uh, had 5,000 students at our Northwest University, mentoring, writing, teaching, uh, 17 years in various subjects of sociology, marriage and family, response to crisis, pastoral care, uh, master's level courses in pastoral care and leadership development. Uh, so he's an expert, is what I'm saying, uh, on relationships. And uh, you and Karen uh, have been, I believe, relocated by God to Oklahoma. Oh, it would only be him, yeah. <laughs> because, uh, because God knew that we needed you. And one of the reasons I feel like God put me in this role is just to encourage healthy relationships, uh, Dr. Charles. And you and I began to talk about that. We connected. You came to our, our district council, and we talked some more. And I said, you got to be on this uh, podcast. Um, and when we first met, you mentioned uh, two recurring themes that happen when we talk about better together or relationships. And can you unpack that a little for us? In my discussion with numerous leaders, and not just denominational or administrative leaders, but mentors, people who have an ear to hear, um, mm -hmm. we all sense spiritually something moving behind the curtain uh, that is distinct. First and foremost is that there is a distinct presence of the spirit of Antichrist globally, um, unlike ever before. The, this has impacted the influence of the institutional church dramatically uh, within our world today. And so we see a, a force of antichrist, just not darkness, not just evil, but specifically antichrist. Yeah, that moral decay that's being... Not just yeah, moral decay, yeah. but that which is, is unchrist, yes. unloving, not Correct. just dark, but just uh, wanting to go the opposite way. And we've never seen such an intensity globally uh, because of the ability to mediate it. Sure. The second thing that we talk about is, in contrast to that, the overwhelming sense of God inviting us to gather into closeness. Mm. There is a, a sense that the Father is like a concerned parent wanting to say, draw near, come mm. inside, there's a storm coming. Yes. And he wants to protect us. And we have a sense and the many people, many families that I know, and especially guys my age, what they're doing is gathering their families close to them. Yes. And, and in this, I believe God sees us strengthening um, our witness as well as clarifying our identity in Christ. The more close that we are, the stronger we become. And so, your phrase of better together is not just a slogan or a cliche. Your vision is a fulfillment of God's purpose for inviting us together. Mm. I sense something, as you say, as our culture is just overwhelmed with that spirit of Antichrist, that as we come together in relationships, we find identity in Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think we're going to have to find that identity apart from what has saturated the world. Mm -hmm. we, we have, after the pandemic, we have a difficulty of trying to re-engage uh, relationally and those kinds of things because of the power of the internet, um, the dislocation of things. People are out of touch with being with other people and gathering, as well as the deception that comes over from the media and those kinds of things mm -hmm. have entangled us terribly. Yeah, so good. Yeah. Um, you were an encouragement to me when we first got together because I feel so strongly that, that healthy relationships are so important 
uh, maybe more than ever before. But how would you suggest uh, we become better together to fulfill God's purpose as the church, as the kingdom of God? Well, there are two major things that I think as a, a denominational leader as yourself would be watching for. it. One, you want to encourage relational process. Um, what we'll do here today is I will show a specific process to help familiarize everybody. It won't seem a surprise. Everybody does this. It's just a sociological observation that we identify that encourages us to move more deliberately in relational interaction. Mm. The second thing that we'll talk about at another time will be we will see um, a unpredictable emergence of servant leaders from places we would never expect mm. in occasions that we wouldn't ever anticipate. And they will emerge and God will raise them, not us. Mm. So the importance of relationship today would be to talk about how we come together in relationships. And so one of the things that I would say, first of all, in these building blocks is that we have no one model or formula that works. If you do this, then this will happen. Relationships are co-created and they're synergistic. Mm -hmm. They, they co-create and they emerge with many unpredictable things. In marriage and counseling for 30 years, you can believe some of the stories uh, how did you get there? <laughs> you know, it takes two. <laughs> yeah. <right? laughs> yeah, and their belief systems. Yes. So we know that they didn't do this, but we all must enter a process. And this process, as I said, is not a formula or a model. It is a sociological observation. Mm. And people can enter this process and engage the process and be committed to it, or they can avoid the process and causing a deterioration of relationships. Withdrawal. Yeah, yes. withdrawal mm -hmm. from things or isolation sure. or not following through. You know what we saw a lot in, in churches is that when a conflict arose, and, you know, because there were no new churches, this is another one, there's so many churches, decentralizing like that caused people to, they get in a conflict in the church, they don't try and resolve it, they just go to another church. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what you'll see in this, this uh, observation is that the very thing you must do is press through the conflict resolution. In order to get to that healthy, strong relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Can you walk us through that? Sure. Yeah. The building blocks begin with the first building block of bonding and nurture. Bonding are the events that we share every day with people. Um, we come together, we do some things, we bond. You and I went to lunch together. It, it, it gave us a bonding that and a was shared. <laughs> it was a shared. There was marriage. no conflict. Yeah, there was no conflict. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> um, but um, those kinds of events what gather people. Nurture then is the meaning that people assign to that. Mm. Like uh, we thought it was a lovely lunch. There are people who go on a date and one person may just think, oh, this is the most wonderful experience. The other person is like really boring, you know. <laughs> so, so, so how we assign meaning to the events and those kinds of things are what construct memory in our mind and how the memory works. These processes of bonding and nurture then take place every day and are done by a process of communication. Communication is not only verbal, it's physical. It's mental, it is emotional, it is spiritual, mm. it is four dimensions. We operate at any one time always within four dimensions. Mm. The physical world that we communicate in is data, information, finances, schedules. Everybody's got to deal with that stuff. We've got to rearrange our world. Our mental process um, is how we order our world by what we believe, how we make decisions how we solve problems, how we um, design our strategies, mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. We think through things, and we use communication to do that. Then there's the emotional world, how I feel about something. You know, every memory we have has some degree of emotionality assigned to it by the limbic system in order for the mind to be able to evaluate um, its value or priority. So interesting. Yeah, so emotion plays an incredible role and how we understand and know our world. Hmm. The spiritual is that deep place in you from which you speak beyond this life. 
Mm. It is deep within us where we feel our eternal hope mm -hmm. and where we embrace that eternal hope. It's how we speak beyond the curtain and those kinds of things. So communication is happening all the time, no mm. matter what. We cannot not communicate. Sure. But anytime there's any form of communication, inevitably there's going to be conflict. It's in, uh, no matter what, eventually it arises. And you can avoid it or engage it. Right. Yeah, withdrawal or... Yeah. Well said, well yeah. said. People who are too overpowering in it never um, find rhythm mm. with another person because they're too controlling. So they plow through that yeah. and they don't allow the relationship to... They don't allow interaction sure. to change their own mind mm. or to combine with somebody else's. Mm. People who avoid conflict, and I would hear this all the time, I don't do conflict. You know, kind yeah, of thing. Right. They never achieve synergistic <clears throat> resolutions. Mm. And this is what their spouses would complain about. I can't get a decision. Mm -hmm. And usually in a, a marriage, there's usually, I always said there's usually a skunk and there's usually a turtle. The, <laughs> the turtle withdraws into the shell and the skunk <laughs> just keeps spraying until, the, <laughs> until there's no more spray left. Uh, <laughs> but both of them, the turtle has to engage and the skunk has to cork it in, in order to to get that relationship where it needs to be. Yeah, to yeah. create something else. Right, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And that's what God invites in marriage. Hmm. Learn love to co-create something else. My understanding in marriage counseling was always we create the kingdom of God in the midst of us. And that's, that's what powerful. I always strived for. Yeah. And so it wasn't my authority, it was the authority of the word. So conflict can be just, I mean, it can be simple too. I mean, it could be as simple as, what do you want for dinner? Sure. Uh, I want spaghetti. I want hamburger. You never consider my need for spaghetti. You never <laughs> love me anyway. You know, it gets into those kinds of rounds. Yes. I'm, We've seen I'm, more bizarre things. I'm, yes. I'm telling you, it's a much more bizarre <laughs> right. than I can do it. Uh, um, but it could also go, hey, you want your spaghetti. I want my hamburger. Why don't you make your spaghetti? I'll make my hamburger. We'll throw them in together and we'll make a new casserole. All right? <laughs> all right. You deal, deal. Then you have the final building block, which is mutuality. Okay, so how do we get there? Mutuality is by resolution. It is not uh, sameness. It is collaboration. It's spaghetti and hamburger making something else. Mm. It is not compromise. Compromise is giving up something in order to gain something. I'm just, we're going to hamburgers. We're yeah, going, yeah, we're yeah, gonna yeah. do what you want. Yeah, yeah. right. And so uh, in doing that, you lose out on um, the new casserole. Hmm. So mutuality then is satisfied agreement. When Karen and I got married, we were, <laughs> we were 19 years old. How we made a decision of two goals in our life that we have worked for, for 51 years is on, beyond me. What are those? The two goals, one, we wanted to be young enough and healthy enough to enjoy each other in later life after children left home. Hmm. Number two, we wanted to be friends with our children. Nice. That's it. Two good goals. Those two goals mm. made hundreds of decisions for us. Mm. When to have children, how to treat children, how to progress in our own health and our own matters, how we resolved our own conflicts. So when circumstances would come, you would filter those through those goals. Those goals always set as the parameter mm. of the marriage. Mm. For 50, for One, 50 years, 51 yeah. years. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Those parameters were extremely helpful mm. by knowing we have to solve the conflict, we have mm. to come to mutual agreement. Mm. This whole process is held together by commitment. Commitment is so important that people know and can trust. What does God continually do and what are his messages over and over and over again? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Mm. I will be faithful even when you are not. His commitment to us. Yeah. yeah. I love that you have the commitment up the side of the building blocks. That has it's, to be there from the beginning. It's the mortar. Yes. It's mm. the mortar that holds the bricks together. Mm. The commitment creates three things for people that establishes strength in relationship. And if you think about this within churches, one of the first things that commitment does is it creates safety so that people can feel safe to come close to someone to be able to understand that I don't have to protect myself. Can let down my guard. Yeah, yes. because this person mm -hmm. is committed to me. Right. If um, within that safety, 
you're able to allow for closeness. Mm. When I'm hurt, I don't want to be close to anybody. I, I have my shop I can go to. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> I, yes. I, 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 I don't want to be around anybody. And so um, people in churches and stuff, if something offends them and stuff like that, they don't go back to church. And so they stay away from it. So the idea that safety then promotes closeness, it invites closeness. And within that closeness, if it is safe, it allows for vulnerability. Hmm. And vulnerability is true, honest relationship. Hmm. And that's where people can be one-on-one -on -one and be real with one another. And think about it, if a church had closeness without the kinds of barriers that they had to protect or felt unsafe in any way. Yeah, it's so good. And, and watching your, uh, your building blocks and thinking about my experience pastoring and, and all those steps, uh, you know, from building and relocation and all the things that we experienced, we, we got to this place that is, you, can't, you can't ever sever. I mean, those relationships are forever now yeah. as you walk through those storms and walk through the conflict and walk through the mutuality. But what, what, is, what is then after mutuality? What this environment does, what a mutual environment of satisfied agreement promotes is a byproduct, and that byproduct is intimacy. Hmm. We, we can't command an intimate moment. We can't say, we're going to have an intimate moment now. <laughs> <laughs> Try that on date night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've tried it. It's really a bad idea. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and nobody cooperates. And so... But intimacy is a surprise. Mm. It comes to us in a, in a moment, and, and it, it is a felt moment when we know that someone else has felt with us. Mm. So I feel felt. And in that, emotion arises. And when an intimate moment happens, it becomes the next bonding experience by which we assign meaning and communicate through memory anniversaries, mm. pictures on the wall, so it grows deeper. Yeah, yes. and, it, and the cycle goes round and mm. round and round. And so when intimacy becomes the next bonding experience, it provides the emotional energy that drives the system. Mm. So, so obviously this is so clear for marriage, for, for friendships, when you have that bonding moment uh, with a friend, but with the church, how would you describe maybe an intimate moment with someone who's come into a church and they've worked through a conflict resolution, they didn't like something, but they worked through it. Uh, how, would, how would you describe that for someone that's um, worked through a journey, maybe they've moved and they've gone to a new church and now they experience that? Well, first of all, they're gonna have to understand that there's a commitment toward them. Hmm. I'm committed to you, I'm going, to stay here. Let's solve this. Let's let's sit through this. Let me hear you until till till we get to solve. The pastor has that commitment from the get go, from the beginning introduction all the way through this cycle. Yeah. Yeah. So and not just the pastor, but mentors. Sure. Many people in the church where they greet them, people have a conflict with maybe a message or something like that. Can they talk about it? Um, you know where I saw a lot of hurt in the church was in the children's area. Hmm. where people have their children there, they're invested, or their, their ch child got hurt, or something of that nature. How do we resolve that? Let's talk about how we care for our children, you know? Hmm. Um, it is bringing it to a resolution in that somebody is vulnerable, honest, and says, let's, let's work through this. They're patient. Sure. And so yeah. they can resolve those conflicts, and they come to a mutual vision. This is the importance of a pastor establishing a church vision of who we are as an identity. Mm -hmm. uh, church I was in yesterday, very clear about who we are. Mm -hmm. And and uh, he reiterated that three, four times throughout his sermon. A commitment to this is our vision. Yeah, yeah this is who we are mm -hmm. to yeah. each other. Sure. And it was all about them being to, toward each other mm -hmm. and how they exampled one another. Pastor said something kind of interesting. He says, my children are better because of you. Hmm. <laughs> God, he's got a lot of confidence in these folks. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Fair. And I think when they resolve it, I think this is where also, when there is a conflict arises and two people come together, Christ is in the midst of them. Mm. And therefore, the Holy Spirit then has a power to create something, not just a resolution between these two people, but a resolution of kingdom proportion. 
This has been so rich, Dr. Charles. Any, any final thoughts or applications to these amazing building blocks? I'd like to encourage sections to, in their meetings, to begin to set up maybe ideas to, for mentors, people who do have time and availability. Uh, one example would be like my wood shop that people, pastors who are in need of something or just to get away, come and build something. Hmm. Um, with I had a teenage boy who was having a lot of trouble with his uh, gender identity and those kinds of things, really struggling because he had uh, three sisters and a mom mm -hmm. and his dad yeah, had taken sure, off. Sure, so, so hard. Yeah, so he was really struggling with his identity. And so I brought him into my wood shop and, made it, and had him make a napkin holder and uh, for his mom and he gave it to his mom for valentine's day and that napkin holder sat in the middle of the table mm. every night and powerful he, he was a, i did that for my mom yeah and it, and, it, and it gave him something to hold on to mm -hmm. imagine a pastor comes in and builds a cross for his church um and uh, or a pulpit or does something in the library and fixes it you know and is able to do something it is encouraging and as I, I'm with him and teaching him wood and those kinds of things. We can mentor. We can celebrate the Lord and the great processes of his creativity. Uh, we just love wood grain. We, we yeah. just, look at that grain. Look at that. <laughs> We're just all the time doing that. We're just always praising mm. the Lord for the amazing creativity mm. uh, and stuff. So sections can have um, mentors like that, guys who know cars. Maybe sure. a pastor needs help with his car or something like that. Or, or just uh, in their home, the pastor's wife, uh, my wife, scroll saws, and she teaches people and kids all the time scroll sawing. And they do that fret work and they, they catch on to it really quick. And it's so encouraging for them to walk out with something in their hand. Little things like that, little small moments like that, God uses to build kingdoms. Interesting. Uh, Dr. Charles is not just wise like our Lord and Savior Jesus and not just has this incredible meek spirit and humility, but he's also a carpenter like our Lord and Savior uh, Jesus. And what he does is just phenomenal. And you even expressed to me, Dr. Charles, that you would be welcoming to people to come in and you could encourage them, mentor them at your shop. And it, 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 it was really my son's vision originally mm -hmm. that he wanted to see the wood shop that Karen and I would built up north and stuff and he said wouldn't it be neat if we could provide single moms or mm. single dads opportunities that they would never get anywhere else yeah and uh he, you know he would do stuff like that and his property out there he, he wants to eventually get it to do serve people in a way that encourages folks who are of lesser advantage it's amazing yeah what a gift uh and and you've been such an encourager to me and to faith. Uh, we're so thankful for you. And uh, we look forward to maybe spend a little time in that shop too. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. <laughs> but I can see, Dr. Charles, God has used you in such powerful ways in your lifelong ministry of counseling and pastoring and teaching and mentoring. But it seems to me that perhaps in this moment in your journey that this is going to be the most impacting moment, that there's going to be uh, true investment in hearts and lives because I just feel your passion uh, for this, for uh, these building blocks of healthy relationships. And I just want to say thanks for encouraging me. Uh, Thank you. Uh, it's my honor to serve you, sir. Thanks for letting me see you at sectional meetings. I've seen you. <laughs> uh, you know, you practice what you preach. And uh, just thanks for being you. We're truly grateful that uh, God brought you to Oklahoma. Well, thank you. And uh, I'll tell you, it, it was such a blessing to be received mm -hmm. the way we were, that we were so encouraged. And one of the things I think that just uh, grabbed my heart was how these people love you and faith mm. and that you guys have such a uh, loving leadership style mm. that demonstrates resilience and closeness that it is a great example for this kind of process mm. it invites us mm. so I thank you for just yeah, the precious kind of leadership words. you give that to really, us that really means a lot um, so if you're facing conflict in a relationship, uh, don't run, embrace, uh, follow Jesus's model because you can get to mutuality and into intimacy, which is where we have to get for healthy relationships. So 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Charles. Can I just pray over this great Absolutely, teaching? Yeah. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Jesus. these moments that we have. I pray it would encourage those that are perhaps running from a, a conflict or disengaging or, or maybe bulldozing over a conflict. But God, I pray that you would help us uh, use these building blocks, uh, these years that Dr. Charles has developed this incredible teaching. Help us apply it to our lives. I thank you for his desire to see all of us in healthy relationships. Uh, Lord, we thank you that when we are in unity with one another, we answer your prayer requests for you prayed that we would be one even yes. as you and the Father yeah, are one. Yeah, so help yeah. us with that today. I pray that you would bless the Kinmans. I pray that you would just bless their ministry, uh, keep them safe in that amazing wood shop, and thank you for bringing them to Oklahoma. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. You've been a true blessing today. Thanks for blessing us. We are better together. Thanks for joining us today. God bless you.